Uh, thanks for that introduction. That was very nice. Uh, uh, about eight years ago, I did, in fact, have a, uh, a, a pain in my left side that my physician thought was a running injury. Uh, but I went to uh, an orthopedist to have it checked out, and he felt around and said, you know, just let's get a quick MRI and make sure that there's nothing else going on in there. So I got the MRI, and lo and behold, it turned out that I had a mass in my abdomen. It's called a, a re in the retroperitoneal region, which for those of you who don't speak medicine means it was like inside my hip, between my hip bone and my pelvis. It's a very difficult place to get to for a surgeon. Uh, and it was big, it was the size of a baseball, and uh, I needed to get to a cancer hospital ASAP and get this thing taken out. Uh, this was a shock. Uh, at the time, my children were uh, a year and a half old and four. Uh, and this is not the kind of information that you want to learn about when you're a young parent. Uh, so I went up to the hospital, and uh, as, as I was in my scrubs getting ready to go in for surgery, uh, some researchers came by with clipboards, and they said, do you mind if we just ask you a few questions uh, about your chem what they said, your chemical exposure? And I said, well, I don't know if I can help you. I really, I've only been a journalist and a professor. I've never worked at, a, uh, despite the fact that I live in Delaware, I've never worked at DuPont. Uh, or any of the other companies, so what could I possibly have been exposed to? And they said, no, we're not interested in industrial chemicals, we're interested in the things that you come across every day, like if we were sitting in this room, you know, the, the stain-resistant chemicals that are in the carpeting, or the acoustic tiles, or the formaldehyde that is in the plywood that, you know, buildings are wrapped in, or your, the cosmetics that you've been exposed to, or, you know, the stuff in your drinking water, the stuff that's on your lawn, all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, yes, I guess I've been exposed to that, because who hasn't? They brought me in for surgery. Uh, I woke up a few hours later, and my wife and the surgeon were smiling at the foot of my bed, and they said, congratulations, it's a boy. No, they said, congratulations, it's benign. Uh, they didn't expect that. Uh, I said, well, what do you mean benign? I thought we were all ready for this big malignancy. They said, well, we see 100 of these tumors a year, and 96 of them are malignant. So lucky me, uh, there I was with a big scar on my belly and, and a lot of questions about what, what all this meant. So I did spend some time uh, trying to revisit the questions that those researchers had asked me uh, pre-op, and this book is the result. Actually, these two books that I'm going to be talking about uh, are the result. Uh, for those of you who are interested, some of you may have been at the, at the talk earlier today, um, I'm currently writing a book about GMOs. It's funny that GMOs is starting to get some real currency now all of a sudden. For me, my, I, I enter the GMO question from this position of uh, inquiry about pesticides, chemical uh, pesticides. So anyway, we can talk about that later. So anyway, this, this is a funny title for this talk. This title is called From DDT is Good for Me to Fracking for the Cure. How an English professor learned the difference between polybrominated diphenyl ethers and neonicotinoid pesticides, became attentive to the ironies of language, and began taking his students canoeing. So one book is called What's Gotten Into Us. Uh, I apologize that there are so few copies out there. Uh, this book is in hardcover. It's coming out in paperback uh, next year and is probably, weirdly, going to have a different title. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but uh, the word, well, I don't want to get into this. But the word gotten turns out to be, I think, of German extraction, and people wanted to call it What's Got Into Us, which is like the English version of this title. And there was a lot of confusion and Anyway, it's going to have a new title, so you might have to look for it under another name. Uh, then, more recently, just in April, the paperback of this book, Poison Spring, has come out, which I co-wrote with a guy who worked at the EPA for 25 years, and that's kind of an insider's look at how a lot of things get approved and what is going on between these industries that we've been hearing so much about and the actual regulators that are theoretically keeping an eye on things, and it's quite revealing in that regard. So I'm just going to tell you a few stories about this. So in 1912, a famous ship goes down in the Atlantic Ocean. Why was it so unusual? There was no plastic on that boat. Now, that may seem self-evident or funny or obvious to you, but that was 1912, and uh, 30 years later, we hit World War II and the industrial explosion that accompanied it, and the plastic century that we now live in essentially was born. So I just want you to think about this. Is really only 100 years ago uh, there were no plastics anywhere. When the, uh, the um, marine uh, um, archaeologists dug that boat out, they found all kinds of things on there, glass and lead and silver and brass and bronze, but they found no plastic. So just think about what happened in the years since then. 
So, as you probably know, and you may have even heard today or in the last few days, a lot of the chemicals that we're talking about uh, were invented, many of them for, for, war, for purposes of warfare, but petrochemicals of all kinds were developed in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, 20 years after this, thanks to Rachel Carson, uh, the world kind of woke up to this stuff called DDT. Uh, I don't know how many, I'm sure you all read this book in high school. It's worth revisiting. Uh, really one of the most important books of the 20th century. DDT up to that point had been marketed as a miracle spray, right? You, could, you can look up photographs of DDT being sprayed on people in a pool. Uh, you know, uh, many of you may even have your own personal memories of walking down your neighborhood streets and being fogged by the DDT truck, right on people's heads, right? What could possibly be wrong? This stuff all it does is kill bugs, right? That was the idea. DDT was marketed as a miracle cure and sprayed all over neighborhoods. You could buy this in any hardware store. So Silent Spring comes out, and suddenly the world is uh, made aware of ecological webs. Now, we can talk about this during Q&A, but it's not like Rachel Carson invented this idea. Uh, but she brought this into the popular imagination that you spray something on bugs, it rains, the stuff goes into the water, goes down into a creek, goes down into a river, fish get contaminated with it, birds eat the fish, people eat the fish, and this stuff, it's called bioaccumulation, right? So the stuff that starts out small, starts to get into little fish, but a big fish eats a lot of little fish, then a bird eats the big fish, or a person eats the big fish, and you're getting multiple um, uh, inputs from the same chemical. So if you're at the top of the food chain, you're getting a lot more than you would if you were just a little fish. Now, I don't know if you know about Rachel Carson's story, but her, her Silent Spring first came out of the New Yorker magazine. It was serialized in the New Yorker, then became a book. And as soon as it came out, the chemical industry did everything it could to uh, uh, destroy her reputation. If you read the attacks that it made on her personally, it's really quite uh, impressive. What a lot of people don't know, and this didn't really come to the our awareness until her biographers told us about it, is that Rachel Carson was dying of breast cancer even as that book was being written. Uh, and yet, she never talked about it. Uh, she never um, used that to defend, you know, in any way to kind of elicit sympathy from people. All she did was publish the book, which, by the way, won every major literary prize there was, and just then had to withstand the attacks of the chemical industry uh, as she was dying. Uh, so then we go back to sleep. That was, you know, in the early 60s, and it's been pretty much downhill since then. If you think about what we briefly were talking about in the early 60s, how much of our public conversation has been about any of this stuff since? Here are a few reasons why this is true. This, by the way, is also the root of the GMO question, uh, so we can talk about that too. So, uh, you know, with all these soldiers returning, I mean, this, this, the post-war housing thing is actually a, one of the most important things in American history, I think. Because after the war, all these soldiers came back and they no longer wanted to live in the cities. We built the interstate highway system, which I'm, you probably know was built to model after Germany's Autobahn. Like the idea was to build this highway system so we could defend ourselves. If after this, uh, this cataclysm of World War II, we wanted to make sure that our country would be uh, defendable. So you build these highways, which suddenly means that people can commute. They can get in their cars and commute to the city. They don't have to live in the city to work in the city. They can live in the, somewhere else and drive into the city. So once you build the highways, then you can build a lot of little roads, and you can start building subdivisions. Now, I'm sure it's true here in Florida. It's certainly true where I'm from. Subdivisions that look a lot like this are absolutely everywhere. So what did those houses get built on top of? They got built on top of farms. What had once been farmland was now, you know, the joke in the 70s was what are farmers growing out there these days? They're growing houses, right? So just keep in your mind the GMO stuff you've been hearing about. If all these farms are being turned into subdivisions so that people can live there, so we can create suburbia, where is our food coming from? This is what we didn't really think about. Well, all our, all our farms are moving, we're migrating west if we were on the East Coast, they were migrating, well, California is its own thing, but all the farms that were in New England, were in the Mid-Atlantic, were in the South, started to move towards the Midwest. In Maryland, I live in Baltimore, in Maryland, uh, in the last 40 years, one million acres have been developed. Now here, we were talking earlier about the, the use of language. Uh, to call building houses development means that it's a uniformly, or assumes that it's a uniformly good thing. We're developing the land, we're improving it, making it better. Uh, that comes at a cost, which we're only beginning to understand. 
So a million acres in 40 years, 873,000 acres of farms disappeared, 500,000 acres of forest disappeared. That's just in Maryland, okay? That's just Maryland. But yet it's just worth thinking about the trend, like all this stuff is happening. Farms are disappearing, suburbanization is happening, and for our purposes, there's a lot to talk about. So since the 1930s, right, pre-war, four million small farms have disappeared, turned into subdivisions bearing nostalgic if ironic names. Think about the names of subdivisions and what the, the joke is that subdivisions are always named for the things that were destroyed to create them. Turning local farms into subdivisions meant tectonic changes both in the scale of our material wants and in the way we eat. So you think about it, you've got all these giant houses out there. Now you've got to fill them up, right? People used to live in little places, little apartments, now we live in big houses and increasingly bigger houses like Levittown you know, Levittown, Long Island, Levittown, New Jersey, those are little houses. Now everybody lives in big houses, and they're filling them up and filling them up and filling them up. So we create giant big box stores to provide everything we could possibly want. Fill our houses with stuff, we fill our bellies with industrial food coming from the Midwest. So consumerism, which everyone talks about, right, there's a structural reason that consumerism happened, because it could happen. We could suddenly move stuff around on the big roads, we had lots of houses, we had lots of uh, shopping malls. And companies were very happy to satisfy our every desire. So here, this is how these chemical companies grew into companies that provide the raw materials to create consumer products. So right now, chemical companies are producing materials to create 70,000 products. Now, 70,000 may seem to you like a little number, but think about, for example, you know, like plastic cups. How many plastic, this would be one of 70,000 products. How many of these are there in the world? Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of them. How many plastic water bottles are there? Billions of water bottles. How many square acres of carpeting is there? How many gallons of paint? How many gallons of pesticides and lawn fertilizers and you name all those things. Each one of those 70,000 is magnified uh, to a very large degree. Chemical company, $637 billion, right? Now, this is where some of their economic clout and along with it, their political clout, where it comes from. So, we create these suburbs, we create these products, and we start buying them and using them like crazy, but we didn't really stop to test them to see whether they were, uh, you know, benign, whether they were, um, would have any negative impacts on our bodies or on the environment. So as you probably know, a great majority of our convenient everyday products are made with petrochemicals. Almost none of them are adequately regulated, which means we don't really know what they're made out of or if they affect our bodies. Now here's a number. I'm not going to use a lot of numbers today, but there are a couple you should know. How many chemicals are in use today? Roughly 80,000. How many have been adequately tested for their impacts on health? 200. This is what it looks like. You've probably heard about these things called body burden studies. The CDC and some local groups are starting to look in, I mean, not particularly well funded, I might, I should say, but they're starting to do things like test people's bodies for the presence of these chemicals. So it turns out that if you take samples of your blood and your hair and your urine and put them through the proper laboratory procedures, you can find out that your body at this very moment has bisph bisphenol A in it, or it has phthalates in it, or it has, if you're using certain kinds of nail polish removers, it might have toluene in it, it might have xylene in it, it might have atrazine, a pesticide, it might even have DDT in your body. Probably there is DDT in your body because there's still DDT that you can actually swab off your windowsill. Even though DDT has been illegal for 40 years, it doesn't disappear. See, one of the great, you know, you, you grew up hearing when people were trying to convince you to recycle, they would say things like, you know, that plastic bottle is never gonna, it's never gonna decompose. Well, that actually is, is more or less true, but it's also true of the constituents of it. So even if it does decompose, it's not like the, the petrochemicals de decompose. There they are, right? You can, people, if you, if you, you'll read stories about this in the paper every now and then, they'll do a local study where someone will swab windowsills in town and start telling you what's in the air, what's just kind of blowing around out there. It's very interesting. Okay, one more number. Uh, every year, the United States makes or imports 27 trillion, that is a T there, 27 trillion pounds of petrochemicals. So if you think about it, if you had a train or a, a truck caravan, uh, each truck capable of carrying 8,000 gallons, this caravan would go from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. and back again. 
So, you know, some of that stuff goes into your car, some goes into your lawnmower, some of it goes to make pesticides or fertilizers, but a lot of it stuff goes to make lipstick and it goes to make plastic bottles and it, makes, it goes to, uh, you know, make your carpeting. It goes to make all the things that we've been talking about. Now, one little side trip here. Um, one thing Americans seem to think is that our country has, has gotten environmentally a whole lot more enlightened because we don't have a lot of industrial pollution anymore. Now, the corollary to that, of course, is we have no jobs anymore either. Uh, so, you know, we, we sent all our industry overseas along with all the jobs that went with them. But if you follow the, the trail from the United States to China, you will find out that China, where all our stuff is being made, they have horrendous environmental and health problems that would be ours if we still made this stuff here. So, when you buy cheap stuff made in China at a Walmart, one of the reasons it's cheap is because labor is cheap in China, but the other reason is that, you know, there are very few, I mean, there are very few environmental regulations in the United States, but there are fewer in China. So cheap goods has consequences, although you may not be able to see them. The direct connection between cheap stuff at Walmart in the United States is a factory in China that is polluting a river in China, which may be causing health problems in China. Do you see what I mean? The global economy doesn't just mean cheap stuff. The global economy means environmental problems and health problems are also global. So those are just some things to think about. I was in China a couple of years ago and uh, in Beijing you can sit in the middle of the day and you can look directly at the sun. Try that here. I mean our air is cleaner than China's but we shouldn't be proud, I mean we shouldn't necessarily feel great about that. Just that China's air is like dirty because we don't, we make our stuff over there, but you can look straight at the sun. You can also, like flying over Shanghai, you can look down and see the river over there on the right hand side there, uh, that kind of chocolate water, you can see that from 10,000 feet, like you can see the runoff uh, in these rivers from, the, from airplanes. So, uh, you know, China makes everything, right? So a couple of years, for the last couple of years, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, some 20 million pieces of children's toys sold in the United States had to be recalled because they were found to have been painted with lead paint in Chinese factories. Now, lead paint has been banned in the United States for 40 years, but it's not banned in China. And, you know, you talk, you hear stories about this and, people, and the companies that make these things initially will say, well, you're not supposed to put a train in your mouth, so what's the problem? You know, maybe a chemical company executives have never had children, I don't know, or something. <laughs> Uh, other things, I mean, I'm just going to give you the news headlines. You've heard many of these things, I'm sure, but products made with hard plastic, right? This is the old Nalgene bottle model. The Nalgene now is not bisphenol A, but um, they used to be made with bisphenol A. Uh, that chemical is a hormone disruptor. And you've probably heard about things like, uh, uh, you know, two public health things that you, you hear about are early onset Puberty in, in, uh, in American girls, girls are, are hitting adolescence earlier and earlier, and also among boys, you hear stories about low sperm counts. Both of these are hormonal imbalances that some people are thinking may be, in fact, uh, affected by these hormone-disrupting chemicals that we're surrounded with. Uh, flame retardants, this is where the polybrominated diphenyl ethers are, uh, are neurotoxic. They are found in everything clothing, mattresses, upholstery, electronics. Turns out that they accumulate in uh, breast milk and be passed on to children. Um, there is an interesting story. Uh, in Sweden, you know, Europe is way ahead of the United States in regulating this stuff, and Scandinavia is even further out. And in Sweden, when they found out about these flame retardants, they simply banned them. You know, Sweden, being very much interested in public health, says, oh, these things are, uh, you know, accumulating in breast tissue, let's get rid of them. They got rid of them, and uh, within three years, the accumulation of these chemicals in women's breast tissue dropped by 30%. Um, so we hear that news, and we, you know, that's not the case in the United States because we haven't banned them. Uh, phthalates, the compounds that make plastic bottles soft. I see many of them around the room. Uh, there, as you take drinks out of those plastic water bottles, uh, you can actually test the migration of the plastic in the bottle into your body. Uh, they, they've done this many times. Uh, I mean, they've even done documentary films of people like drinking nothing but water out of plastic water bottles, and you test your urine, and there it is. There's the phthalates right from the bottle. I mean, the stuff 
is, uh, is quantifiable. And if you ever have warm liquid in a bottle, it leaches that much faster. So one thing to keep in mind is that, I mean, there are many reasons not to drink water out of plastic bottles. Primarily, it's incredibly expensive. It's more expensive than gasoline. Uh, you want the water, but you don't want the bottle, right? What you're, what you're buying for $1.69 a liter or whatever it is, is the water. You don't want the bottle. You just want the water. But what you're getting literally is the bottle because you're drinking the bottle as well as the water. And then, of course, you have this thing you have to throw away. And as you know, like a very tiny fraction of all plastic bottles are actually recycled. So now you're adding that into the system. So one recommendation I would say is do your best to wean yourself off of plastic water bottles. These same plastics, though, are also found in all kinds of soft plastic things like uh, you know, baby toys. Also, weirdly, they're in air fresheners. So if you, you're not necessarily going to see this on any labels, which is something we'll talk about, but, you know, if you spray an air freshener, you're also spraying phthalates into your room. If you ever go into, a, like, a public restroom or an airport or something, and you see those um, air fresheners that are mounted, those, like, uh, motion-sensitive air, that's squirting, you know, hormone-disrupting chemicals into the air. And there's nothing you can do about that, right? You, you, you know, you got to go when you got to go, but there it is. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's just entering the atmosphere. So you'd like to try to avoid that stuff. Uh, the labeling thing is a real problem because, uh, as you know from the GMOs, uh, almost nothing is labeled. And the reason nothing is labeled is because companies want to keep it that way. They don't want you to have to think about what's, your, what's in your products. Some things are labeled. Like you will go into the hardware section of a, of a big box store and you might see things that will say, uh, warning, this product is known to cause cancer in California. And you say, well, good, I'm in Florida, no problem, you know. Uh, that's because California regulates stuff. They force you to put a label on it. And it's because these companies are making products for the national market, they stick that stuff with a good label on it in a place in Florida. But most products have no label on it, including especially cosmetics, which we'll talk about in a minute. But even if it has a label on a product in the hardware section, uh, you will find, if you're, if you're looking for it, you will find products in the cosmetics section that has the same chemical in it but no label because cosmetic companies have so far successfully managed to avoid any regulation about putting labels on their products. So this is literally the same chemical that goes into like a degreaser and goes into a... Uh, into personal care products. And you know, you might wonder what kind of enlightened regulatory system regulates products that go on your engine block but not products that go on your skin. Uh, the three largest users of the pink ribbon label on cosmetics, Avon, Estee Lauder, and Revlon, remain unwilling to sign a pledge to remove carcinogens like parabens, toluene, and benzene from their products. This is why uh, it really bothers me when I see, you know, the pink ribbons or the pink shoes on the NFL players or the pink bats in the major league or something like the successful manipulation of breast cancer awareness has allowed companies to slap the pink label all over the place, even when in some cases they're actually using products that have carcinogenic ingredients. There's a term for it, you've probably heard it, it's called pink washing. Pink washing. Put a pink ribbon on it and you're okay. People will think, you know, they're looking at a product and say, oh, I'd like to support breast cancer. They buy that product, turn around and use it, and it's got problematic ingredients in it. And then there's my own uh, particular pet peeve, which is uh, lawn chemicals. Now, I don't know about here in Florida. I'm guessing it's similar to where I live. Uh, every spring, you will turn on the TV or pick out, you know, see ads in the newspaper pushing uh, perfectly green monoculture grass. And it's funny, uh, they're usually ads with lots of really pretty white kids. Um, there's all kinds of subliminal messaging going on here, which we could spend a lot of time talking about. So lots of kids, lots of babies, lots of pets on these lawn care ads. And what they'll say is spray, 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 fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. So let's think about lawns for a minute. How much lawn is there in the United States? There's 50 million acres of grass, which is about the size of Nebraska. Now, you might say, well, that's not bad. That's, you know, only one of 50 states. Everything else is cool, right? Well, I don't know about you, but, like, I grew up having to mow a tiny lawn in New York, and I wouldn't want to mow Nebraska, you know, once a week. You know, it's all right, Sunday morning, son, time to go out and mow Nebraska. 
you know, if you think about what it would take to maintain a really healthy lawn in Nebraska, it would take a lot of chemicals. Because what does a lawn want to be when it grows up? A lawn wants to be a forest, right? A lawn, everything wants to progress. In order to keep that lawn from becoming a forest, what you have to do is you have to mow it and you have to spray it. 50 million acres. It's a lot of grass and a lot of pesticides and a lot of fertilizer, which is a whole nother question. But it's not just our home lawns. We spray our schools, our colleges, our hospitals. You'll see stories about some of these lawn care companies saying things like, um, we will donate a new scoreboard to your school if you give us your, lawn, your, your um, groundskeeping contract. And, you know, schools have no money, right? This is one of the big problems. Is no schools have any money anymore. So they say, sure, we need a scoreboard. So you get a scoreboard, and then you get these guys up and down spraying the school grounds. Uh, interesting how some of this stuff shows up. You'll find veterinarians saying it's, we've seen this uptick in lymphomas in, in uh, dogs and cats. Where's that coming from? And the theory is that dogs and cats roll around in the grass and they cover their entire body with these chemicals. We, you know, we walk around and cover the bottoms of our shoes. Interestingly, though, you can find these lawn chemicals inside your house because you're tracking them in. Right? But a, a dog or a cat is rolling around and getting their whole bodies covered. Uh, they did a study in Denver where they showed that kids who grew up in yards that were treated with pesticides were four times more likely to develop soft tissue tumors than kids whose yards were not treated. You've heard a little bit about this, I know. Fertilizers and pesticides, you know, like once it rains, we spray all this stuff all over the place, and then it rains, right? Where does it all go? It all goes, all, goes away, right? It's off, it, it disappears downstream. It rains, it goes down into your street, goes down into a sewer, goes down into a river, and if you live in Maryland, it goes into the Chesapeake Bay. If you're here, it goes into the Gulf of Mexico, right? You heard, if you were at the GMO talk earlier, you hear about these things called hypoxic dead zones. What this mainly is in, in uh, most of these bays is a product of these fertilizers running off of farms and running off of family yards that, you know, what does a fertilizer do? It stimulates plant growth. So all these fertilizers run into the bay and all the algae goes bananas, right? It's suddenly got this enormous supply of food. Algae goes crazy, grows, and then it all dies because algae doesn't live very long. And as it dies, the decomposition of that algae sucks all the oxygen out of the water. So this is a picture of the Chesapeake Bay in August in what's called a dead zone. You see all that algae there on the top? That wasn't there before. Fertilizer runs off, that algae goes boom, and then it dies, and then all the oxygen in the water gets sucked out during decomposition. That means there's no oxygen in the water. So there is nothing living in the water, nothing. Not a crab, not a fish, not a plant, nothing. And when you hear about the Gulf of Mexico, you hear about the Chesapeake, you hear like off the coast of San Diego, where, wherever there's big runoff from these big, big um, farm and subdivision areas, you find gargantuan dead zones. So this is what it looks like, right? So you have fertilizer on this farm, or if this is your yard and you've sprayed all these, things, all these chemicals, it rains, it all runs right off. That's, you need to multiply that by 50 million acres of lawn and you know, X number of acres of, of farms, and you're talking about massive collateral damage to the use of these chemicals. This is environmental stuff, I realize, but you know, that's also our drinking water. I guess I don't have to make that too plain, right? Where do you think our drinking water comes from? Right? This is where it comes from. So there's a, an algae bloom in Lake Erie. There's an algae bloom in, the, bloom in the Gulf of Mexico. From space, right? From space. Oh, and then, so then there's the artificial turf thing. I, this has kind of been evolving over the last couple of months. This is a fascinating thing. I, I have to say, even though I wrote this book, I never predicted this. There are 10,000 artificial turf fields in the United States. So what does you ever think about what artificial turf is made out of? Now, I don't even actually know what the grass is made out of, but underneath it, the black stuff that it's made on is made out of recycled tires. The Synthetic Turf Council will tell you that it keeps 20 million used tires out of the landfill every year, which is a good thing. 20 million tires. But what are tires made out of? Tire dust, that is to say the stuff of bro breaking down tires, contains heavy metals. Carcinogens like butylated hydroxyanosol and other severe irritants. 
the reason this story got some attention was that the University of Washington's varsity women's soccer coach started just hearing stories about soccer players in Division I soccer that had cancer. And according to her very unscientific study, there were 38 players that had cancer and 34 of them were goalies. And she said, I wonder why that is. And she started to speculate. I mean, granted, this is not scientific, but you know, a lot of stuff that science ends up getting to is, is generated initially by folklore, by stories, by people telling people things. She said, well, I wonder if it's because goalies spent all this time rolling around on this synthetic turf. Now try this, the next time it's your kids or your grandkids' soccer game, go kick your foot on the synthet synthetic turf and just see what happens. You can actually generate like clouds of this black dust. I mean, I, you, it's very easy to do, but of course none of us ever thought to do it. So, because we replace our small farms with large suburban homes, we now depend for our food on industrial agribusiness run by fewer and fewer companies. You know this, right? We've already hear, been hearing about this. So these big companies mow down the small family farms. Farms are sold out to create subdivisions. GMO crops, right? We've already been hearing about this. Here they come, right? So now you've got all these farms out in the Midwest, and these crops, these seeds, are developed by the same companies that make the pesticides, so now they can sell both seeds and pesticides, and they've got the whole thing figured out. The urging of chemical companies, industrial farms have become increasingly chemical dependent. Right? This stuff is now so common that we don't even think to question it. Just a half dozen companies really control our food supply. So uh, you've been hearing a little bit about this too, but inside the EPA, the FDA, the USDA, all the agencies that regulate our food, as you probably know, all these places are essentially overseen by political appointees that depending on who is in the uh, White House, tend to be very industry friendly. So I don't know if you know this, but like these, these agencies have like this kind of glass barrier between the scientists who are there, no matter who's in the White House, and the political positions that, are, that change whoever comes in, right? So you have a business friendly administration, those guys you know, occupy the top administrative posts. So as the science is done here at the bottom, it trickles up through the agency and then it hits this wall or this, this ceiling because the political people say, huh, you're telling me that your research is showing you that X, Y, and Z is, is either got negative consequences for people's health or the environment. Well, if we decide that we're going to ban something, that's going to affect the company that I worked for like six months ago or that I plan to work for again in six months. So the political the revolving door, as it's known, between the, the companies and the industry happens above the glass ceiling. It happens at the political appointment level. The scientists out there are... Uh, really in a very difficult position because even they, when they do good work, it can't penetrate and, and get out through the political level, which is to say it also doesn't trickle out to us because if it doesn't get out in the agency, it's not going to get out to the public. So the book, The Poison, uh, Poison Spring, that I was mentioning earlier, has information in there like this. Uh, in the seven years between 97 and 2004, industry paid for 10,000 retreats and conferences for EPA officials in places like Australia, China, Atlantic City, and Las Vegas. So in the most literal sense, this is industry and regulators hanging out, which, you know, I'm sure is fine. I mean, I'm sure it makes relationships very cozy. But it doesn't necessarily make for the most kind of publicly, uh, public health-minded uh, regulation of these companies. How many acres across the South and Midwest are planted with GMO crops? 170 million. You've heard a lot about this. I apologize if this is repetitive for you, but Roundup Ready Seeds is also available, or Roundup, the, the chemical glyphosate is also available in your hardware store. You see people, I see people almost every day uh, with their little hand squirters squirting Roundup all over the place. Uh, Agent Orange, as you, many people remember from uh, Vietnam, one of its constituents is 2,4-D, uh, very common, popular herbicide, uh, also available uh, in your local hardware store and your local supermarket. And until recently, I, I teach at the University of Delaware, and they were using 2,4-D all over our campus, and then my, in, I told my environmental journalism students about it, they wrote about it, and it caused such a flap that uh, the grounds crew had to decide to use something else. It was kind of a rare moment of um, 
political pressure rising from my students. It was very interesting, actually. Um, you, you know this too, right? So it's very important to remember that all the corollary or unintended or downstream consequences of all these chemicals, you know, these chemicals were not designed to, uh, you know, eradicate the bee population. They were not designed to eradicate the monarch butterfly population, but they do. The end result is that they do. So the neonicotinoid pesticides you, you hear about causing this bee colony collapse, uh, the, the pesticides that kill milkweed, you know, monarch butterflies basically only eat one thing, they eat uh, milkweed. If you kill all the milkweed, the monarchs have nothing to eat. One third of our food comes from bees. These neonic, as they're called, neonic pesticides, they're made in Germany by Bayer, uh, but they're banned in Germany. But we'll use them. It's just like a lot of the pesticides made by Syngenta are illegal in Switzerland, but happily used in the United States. This neonicotinoid thing is becoming quite a hot issue right now. You'll, you'll start to see, if you haven't already, you'll start to see quite a bit of attention. Uh, one more thing, fracking. Uh, I don't know if this is a big thing in Florida. Uh, certainly where I live, it's a huge deal. Uh, Pennsylvania is right in the middle of this whole, you know about fracking, the hydraulic fracturing of rock that releases all this natural gas. Now that the country is becoming energy independent, uh, natural gas that has gotten by fracking is becoming very popular and profitable. Uh, there's something known as the Halliburton loophole, which you probably can imagine is traced back to Dick Cheney. When companies came to the Bush White House and said, we've got this new technology to release natural gas from the ground by pumping highly pressurized water and chemicals into the ground, it's gonna release all this natural gas. Um, but we're we're, there's, there may be some problems with this, these chemicals getting into drinking water. So Cheney uh, convened a panel to see if this was really going to be a problem, and he picked a whole bunch of industry people to be on the panel, and the panel said, no problems, uh, hydraulic fracturing is not, uh, will now formally be exempt from uh, clean water, the Clean Water Act and from the Safe Drinking Water Act. That was in 2003. What do you know? Uh, lo and behold, a uh, very well-known uh, endocrine researcher, Theo Colburn, who just actually passed away, uh, found that there are 171 fracking fluids containing 245 chemicals that harm the human hormone system. In Pennsylvania, these fluids are dumped into water used by 16 million people. But that doesn't prevent fracking companies, like one called Baker Hughes, from painting its drill bits pink and giving $100,000 to the Susan G. Komen Foundation uh, to support breast cancer research. In 2012, 562,000 people worked in the fracking industry. This is the other thing, people only think of fracking as being a problem for people drinking water, but don't forget the people who work in this business. You know, think about places like North Dakota and Wyoming and Pennsylvania where this stuff is happening, very large scale. Fracking workers have been found to have benzene, a proven carcinogen in their urine. These workers are at higher risk for leukemia. The longer, the more frequently they do this, the more likely they are to get leukemia, particularly if the levels are high. This is the former dean of the Pitt School of Public Health. So when you hear arguments about small government, about how small government is, is best government, uh, this is what it looks like. So there's a fracking well. New Mexico. New Mexico has 99,000 fracking wells. How many people does it have to inspect them? So that's small government, right? That's small government. So what you get with small government is lots of happy industry people and lots of happy, unhappy uh, drinking water people. So uh, with all this going on, what are we supposed to do about it? Are we supposed to change our laws? Are we supposed to shop differently? Are we supposed to overthrow uh, the way we think about things? The EU, Canada, you know, like I said, uh, Scandinavia, they are all doing pretty interesting things, banning chemicals. There's something like, uh, let's see, the last count was like 400 chemicals in American cosmetics that are illegal in Europe. That's just one industry, but 400 chemicals. The United States, these companies have so much power, you'll, you'll often hear these companies say things like, we want to consolidate all regulation at the federal level. We don't want to pass 
we don't want each state to pass its own versions of anti-toxic laws. Because what a headache. Wouldn't it be such a headache if we had to adhere to one set of laws in Canada, or in uh, California, and a different set of laws in Massachusetts? Let's just have one source of laws. That's what they'll say. The reason for that, of course, is they can control legislators in Washington. There are only 535, right? 435 in one house, 100 in the other house. That's a very small number of people to deal with. And money, as you know, flows freely into Washington. Um, in the book, What's Gotten Into Us, I spent a lot of time in the state of Maine. Fabulous place. Uh, I spent a lot of time up there. Uh, and they decided they wanted to pass a very comprehensive anti-toxic law. And industry came in there, and they threw money at it, and they lobbied, and they lobbied, and they lobbied, and they lost. Because Maine doesn't have a lot of industry. So a main legislator listening to a, a lobbyist from the company and a bunch of angry moms actually decided to go with the moms. Yay. So I should tell you right now, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but um, the only political force that is ever going to beat these companies are angry mothers. So, uh, and I'm, that, is, like, that is not even... Uh, uh, I'm not even kidding about that. That is actually like the, uh, and not to sound all deep about this, but like the moral power of, of mothers seems to be the only thing that can convince somebody to turn away money. So there's actually kind of a deep history about that. Like women, it turns out like women were the only people that could stop war in ancient Greece too, you know? Like, you know what you can always say to a guy? Stop fighting or I won't have sex with you. You know, like that's, you read like Greek drama, Greek theater, that's what, their, their plays written about this, right? So women can say, uh, you know, enough with the breast cancer causing chemicals. And it's pretty tough to say, to turn your back on that. So it seems to be, and I'm, I'm just, Maine is like the, uh, the living proof of that. So California, Washington, Maine, some of these states are doing some interesting things about cosmetics about some uh, things like pesticides and fertilizers, uh, some of these uh, co consumer products. Uh, what can we do as consumers? Uh, go old school. Uh, your grandmother didn't need synthetic chemicals, and neither do you. Rule of thumb, apples are better than Twinkies, just like you should eat real food with ingredients you can recognize. So you should consider only buying things made from materials that you can pronounce. Stainless steel cookware, you want non-stick? There's this new product in the market, it's called olive oil. <laughs> Clean your kitchen, your bathroom, your laundry, your teeth, your hair, anything else that needs to be cleaned with things made out of plants. If you want your house to smell like an apple pie, don't spray it, bake an apple pie. If you use a lawn care service and they insist on using pesticides, find a different company. This will be good for the environment and all the cute things that enjoy it. <laughs> Better yet, uh, consider tearing up parts of your lawn and replacing it with native trees, shrubs, and flowers. I, again, I don't know, this, this has got to be an issue in Florida. Certainly in the mid-Atlantic, the loss of native plants is really quite a catastrophe. And I have a colleague uh, named Doug Tallamy, who I'd like to recommend his book. He's, he's an entomologist has written a great book called Bringing Nature Home about how you can turn your own garden into uh, essentially a wildlife preserve. And he said if everybody took 10% of their lawns and planted native trees and native plants, you would create the greatest national wildlife ref refuge in the United States at no taxpayer expense. So try it. And then lastly, just because I'm an English professor, I have to do this whole thing. Uh, we need to reconsider our whole relationship with consumption and the natural world itself. So at the University of Delaware a couple of years ago, I started an entire new program called Environmental Humanities, where we study the environment, but from every other point of view. We read things like spiritual writing. We read the, uh, Christianity's Desert Fathers. Now, these are people who lived a long time ago in a very unwelcoming place. Turns out that their writing was deeply engaged with the natural world. Who would have thought, you know, third century Christian mystics might have something to tell us about the environment? We read Buddhist texts. I like to say it offers insight into our impulsiveness and the weird human need to seek identity and meaning in material objects. We study Taoism. 
Greatest example of Taoism, right? Here's, I don't know if you've read the Tao Te Ching or any of the great Taoist texts, but if you think about what a river does, what a river does is it goes like this, right? A river wants to do this. What does the Army Corps of Engineers do? <laughs> right? Or it builds levees. Now think about this. If you build levees up and down the Mississippi River, the Mississippi River for eternity has risen and flooded, risen and flooded, risen and flooded, up and down the entire river. If you build levees so that the river can't flood, what's going to happen when all that volume of all that water keeps going and trying to dissipate and trying to dissipate and it can't, and it finally hits a place like, I don't know, New Orleans? What happens? Right? The energy comes in like a tidal wave. So, you know, natural systems want to do what natural systems do. The more we engineer it, the more uh, trouble we get. So, you know, China has more to contribute to our uh, awareness of things than the barcode. That's, that's my point. Uh, richly integrated ways of being can be found in indigenous shamanic wisdom. If you've ever read a book called Black Elk Speaks, great Native American uh, wisdom tradition, uh, very useful thing to think about. Ecology. Aldo Leopold, I'm sure many of you know, the father of American ecology, says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Written in 1948, right? Three years after the end of, the world, of world War II, 14 years before Silent Spring. And then, of course, there's the pure joy of rediscovering our beautiful watersheds and ancient be, uh, ways of being in the world. So every year, I take my students, who are not science students, they're humanity students, I take them canoeing on the Susquehanna River, one of the biggest rivers. Turns out, actually, the Susquehanna is one of the three oldest rivers in the world. The river is so old, they think it was actually uh, there when we had one continent. Before the continent split, the Susquehanna was there. And there is some of the oldest rock that you can find anywhere uh, exposed along the banks. So we go canoeing. That's actually my daughter there on the left. It was kind of, she's not in college, she's 11, but uh, just take your kids to work day and she picked the right day to come. That's my son, he's uh, 14. Bald eagles, right? Right there, we sat down on a rock, had lunch with a bunch of students, and there was a bald eagle there 20 yards from us, watching us the entire time. Now, it's worth remembering that 50 years ago, because of one pesticide, DDT, bald eagles, our national bird, was virtually extinct. There are very, very few pairs anywhere in the United States. And do you know the way this happened, right? DDT gets into the, into the food system, ends up migrating up the food chain, and by the time a bald eagle eats a contaminated fish, and it goes and lays an egg, the DDT has affected its hormone system to the point that the eggshell is super thin, so the, the mama bird sits on the egg and the egg breaks, right? So DDT caused the disruption in the reproductive system of eagles and osprey and great blue herons and falcons and everything else, and they came very close to going extinct. You ban DDT, and now bald eagles are actually, there's so many bald eagles now, the Baltimore Sun is now writing stories that say things like, uh, Injured bald eagles are showing up in all these bird rehab centers because there's so many of them that are starting to compete for territory. So they're fighting each other all over the place. There are nesting bald eagles everywhere in the Chesapeake Bay now. I'm guessing you have probably find quite a few in Florida too. That is thanks to one decision which is to ban DDT. So those are my students having a nice day at the office. And that's me in a kayak. Um, I've also recently, uh, just in the last six months or so, started taking my students to an organic farm where we also study agriculture and, and you know, teaching kids how to simply plant things. You might be surprised how few young people could tell you where a potato comes from. Where do they grow on trees, they say? And then you show them one, they'll say, that's, that's dirty, I don't want dirt. And they're like, you say, well, um, you know. So... A good question we should ask ourselves is, do you think someone should get a college degree if they don't know where a potato comes from? <laughs> I had a student tell me that she had to run out of my class earlier because she had a, a marketing class where her final project was coming up with a marketing plan for Dunkin' Donuts. So this is, in my opinion, what an English major should be doing with some of their time. So those are the two most recent books. Uh, 
that you can find them out there, I think, and uh, if not, you can find them online. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, sir. Question going back to the Halliburton uh, uh, issue. Uh, are states still non challenging the federal government? Uh, Clean Water Act now, where the state feels their interests are at risk, the fracking is being done, the reckless weather. So his question was, are, given what we now know about the pollution that is caused by fracking, are not the states trying to take control of the legal regulatory system back from the feds? And I'm going to answer in, a, in probably an unsatisfying way and, and say that I, I think it's worth acknowledging the complexity of the fracking question. So now think about this. 9-11 happens and the whole world gets spun out of whack. And what, one of the first things we did besides invade the wrong country was we decided that we would try to become energy independent. We would try to find sources of energy that didn't require us to go to the Middle East. And one thing we came up with was finding all this natural gas. So one of the problems with getting rid of fracking is that it actually has solved one problem. It has solved the problem of getting all our energy from you know, an unstable, volatile part of the world. So when people say we need fracking, I actually understand what they're saying at a, like a geopolitical level. But in terms of the environment, it's very difficult to, or I should say, given that, it's very difficult for the environmental argument to hold sway because they'll say, we need to get rid of fracking or regulate fracking. They'll say, what do you want to go back to Middle Eastern oil again? And that's actually an effective argument. I mean, that's a, that's a difficult thing for an environmentalist to answer. The short answer is that as far as I know, the states have not been very successful at um, unwinding an existing fracking industry. Pennsylvania, it is, the horse is way out of the barn. Um, in New York, though, there, you know, um, Governor Cuomo is doing more to try to regulate it. Part of it is because he has consumers of fractured, of, of fracking energy. He doesn't have producers of it. You know, it's the states where the producers, the industries exist that have the most difficult time because the industry holds more power in the political channels than consumers do. So in Maryland, I mean, Maryland is a funny place because in Maryland we have a tiny, tiny fraction of the state where you could frack if you wanted to. We have, on the other hand, Baltimore, where most of the, a great deal of the fracked gas is piped so that we can then ship it overseas. One of the great things about fracking to, keep, to be aware of is that a lot of the gas that we're fracking is being shipped. It's not being used by the United States. So it's a great profit maker, but it also is supporting the shipping industry. And Baltimore, as you probably have read in the last month, has had a lot of problems economically. So you have a new industry that is built on shipping fractured gas overseas. So if you say in Maryland, we want to get rid of fracking, you might have a real problem, not with the fracking companies, but with the shipping companies. So there's all kinds of complexity here. The short answer is, as far as I know, th there's been no successful pushback. Where it has not yet happened, there's some resistance, but it has not been rolled back yet, and I don't foresee that happening. Yeah. We are shipping 80 to 90 percent of this fracking gas overseas. We are now in uh, energy independent. I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that. Maybe it's because we have so much of it that we're just able to use it and then ship the excess that we're not using. I just know that that, that is that it, what you've just said is a fact. Yeah, go ahead. I, I know no one in here drinks sodas, but for the people who are out there who still drink sodas, do you know if they're still putting the same ingredients that make up the flame retardant in the drinking sodas? Uh, like the, the I won't name any name of the sodas, but do you know if they're still putting them in the sodas? If anyone knows precisely which chemicals she's talking about, I'd like to know. Brominated vegetable oil? Yes. The question is, are, are they using flame retardant chemicals in sodas? And someone said brominated vegetable oil, which I have to tell you is news to me. I don't know about that. Yeah. So I do know, I'm sorry, I do know that, that uh, sodas. And it's Cresca, Gatorade, and um, Mountain Dew. OK, 
Okay, well, thank you. That would be something to look into. You should probably speak to her. I will tell you that uh, you are getting GMO corn in your, in your sodas because of the high fructose corn syrup. And as you heard earlier today, also probably GMO sugar beets to get the sugar. So I don't know about the, I don't know about the flame retards, but you're definitely getting GMOs in your soda. That's, that's for sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so we have these BPA-free plastic bottles and the craziness around BPA-free. So it's just one thing, right? So it's still not healthy, it's just one chemical in. Right, so it's BPA-free, it's not chemical-free. And I will tell you, uh, I can only tell you a little bit about this, but the, there is new evidence starting to trickle out that the chemicals that replaced BPA are also not entirely benign. So. Right. I mean, the point is that you can get away from all that by not drinking out of a plastic bottle. Do you know, I mean, there's, it's kind of like, um, you know, replacing one chemical with another chemical is never going to get you out of the problem. The, the way to get out of the problem is just not to use the plastic bottle. Do you see what I mean? Like, the, the, there's no way to, like, incrementally step your way away. You just got to chuck the whole thing. I mean, you can, you can keep yourself up all night thinking about the ways that you're dependent on plastics. I think the general answer is do your best to get rid of as much of it as you can as he drinks his water. I, carry, I buy small mason jars and I carry my water around with me wherever in small mason jars. It's not that hard. You filter your water at home, and you carry small glass mason jars. You have no idea how much it would save you and the environment just doing that one simple thing. Yeah, I, I really, I think, hard. you know, just try some experiments at home with things like that. Like, just try to carry, carry a plastic bag around for a week and tally up the number of plastic bottles that you personally consume. And you might be horrified. I mean, it, even if you think of yourself as a relatively green person, you might be surprised how much you generate. It's really, it's become so invisible and so convenient that we don't even see it anymore. So that's, that's worth thinking about. Yeah, please, go ahead. Are there any plastics, especially like for kids? We're, we're in Florida, so we are big into Tervis tumblers just because they don't break. Any of that any good? <laughs> you know, uh, look, I'm just an English professor. I, what can I tell you? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm also not a purist. I mean, I come up here and I take a purist line just for argument's sake, but you know, the reality is it's very difficult to get away from this, and I, I acknowledge that. I do think that becoming more educated about the whole picture is worth doing so that you can make better choices each time you make a choice. And you'd actually be surprised over the course of a day how many times you have a choice to make. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and list good products versus bad products. I would just say that if you can, like one of the early chapters in this book talks about this whole, you guys know about this whole concept of mindfulness. This is like a, a Buddhist meditation thing, but mindfulness is like, instead of reacting, reacting, reacting all day long, just reacting, 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 you actually sort of think about it and say, huh, normally I buy this, but maybe I'll take a breath and I'll think about it for a second and then choose something different. And the best example of this, real quick, and I'll get to your question, um, is uh, laundry detergents. So you may ask yourself, why is it that you use the laundry detergent that you use? And oftentimes, the answer is incredibly unconscious. You use a laundry detergent because your mother used that laundry detergent. Maybe her mother used that laundry detergent before her. It turns out that's not an accident. You know, for those of you who have, uh, were English majors or French majors and read Proust, you know that, like, the way that uh, memory is stored in, uh, in, your, in your sense of smell is well documented, right? So smells generate all kinds of memories, right? So the people that make these products like laundry detergent, they know that using Tide brings up sentimental, nostalgic memories for you. So you think, ah, I remember the way my sheets used to smell when I was a kid. I'm going to have them smell the same way. So you buy the same product. In other words, you walk into the supermarket, and either your eyes or your nose are telling you, must buy this, must buy this, must buy this. So you buy that without thinking about it. When you find out that Tide may not be the ideal laundry detergent, maybe you could take a breath and say, my kids are growing up on seventh generation instead or something. And they'll get all nostalgic about a plant-based product, just as an example. Yeah. Uh, back to the plastic. Uh, EcoZenith is one of the sponsors of this conference, and we make a 
an alternative plastic that's 100% natural and 100% compostable. And so please come to our booth and take a look at some options that uh, we think could completely replace plastic. Thank you. Uh, you know, let me reinforce that. Great idea. You know, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to say something. Um, one of the chapters in the book, as I said, is based on Maine and how all the angry moms up in Maine beat back these, these uh, multinationals. Now, Maine is a place that is very poor. It's very rural and it's very poor. There used to be a booming potato industry in northern Maine in a place called Arusta County, had a booming potato industry. But when McDonald's decided to buy all their potatoes from one place in Idaho, that potato industry went bust. But it turns out that you can make a lot of stuff out of potatoes. Your products may be made out of corn, I guess. Or, but it turns out you can make plastic out of potatoes. Now imagine this. What if you could take all those out-of-work potato farmers and say, go back to making potatoes, and we'll turn those potatoes into plastic cups or plastic bottles or plastic computer you know, frames or whatever you're going to make out of plastic, you can make out of potatoes, just like you can make them out of petrochemicals. Right? If there was a big kind of research push into that sort of thing, these natural versions, I mean, plastic just means something that can be you know, synthesized into make many different kinds of products. You don't just have to make them out of petrochemicals, as you well know. So there are all kinds of potential future roads to travel, not just the one that we've been on. Yes, please. How dangerous it is to freeze water in the bottle? Freeze it. How dangerous, did you say? Yes, to freeze the water in the bottle like this. To freeze the water? Yeah, but in the freezer. <sighs> With, so then when it melts, you then drink it? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yes. Uh, you know what? I'm only going to speculate. When I said earlier that you've got room temperature water and you've got hot water, and hot water makes the plastic leach faster, I would just assume that cold water makes it leach slower. So I don't know this, but I would not be surprised if you're getting a slower leaching of the water into the frozen water. But on the other hand, how long has that water been in that bottle before you bought it? Do we know? A week? A year? Who knows, right? I mean, that... The plastic has been leaking into the water as long as the water has been in the bottle. So whether you freeze it or heat it may, in the end, have no consequence. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know if you know this, but apparently when you eat a fast food hamburger, the meat in the hamburger has been dead for a year. Now, not that you need any more reasons not to eat fast food, you know, but like there's another reason. You know this story, like science teachers will, will show their students, they'll take a, 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 a you know, a a quarter pounder and they'll stick it on the windowsill and a year later it'll still be there and the reason is there's like not enough nutrition to support bacteria you know it's like the thing doesn't even won't even decompose so anyway go ahead have you heard of the company called Melaluca mm -hmm. and if you do do you recommend their products they Melaluca. say they make chemical free household cleaners sure well I think Melaluca makes um the actual chemical, mel or melaleuca, the melaleuca tree from Australia, I think, produces, what does it produce? Tea tree oil. The tea tree oil, yeah, too. tea tree oil can be used for all kinds. So that's an example of a natural um, ingredient that can be used all kinds of ways, just like, you know, lemon juice and vinegar. I mean, all these natural things that you can use to clean everything. Yes, the answer is it's a, I mean, those are, uh, let's say it's a, I don't know about the company, but the ingredients are more benign than the petrochemicals, I think. Uh, go ahead. I only use vinegar and baking soda in my house, and it cleans everything. You don't have to buy another thing. Right, it turns out that people were able to clean their houses before they came up with petrochemicals, right? <laughs> you know, it's amazing that that was true. It's like people say, there's no way we could feed the world using organic farming. It's like, well, you know, 100 years ago, there was no other kind. So it's just a, it's a funny thing. Go ahead. Um, I, I also have chemical sensitivity, and just, I'm just saying from my experience, I feel like I'm the canary in the coal mine. Like, unfortunately, I might be the future of some people. Um, even laundry detergents that are fairly pure, I think you also have to get out the fragrances, because a lot of the fragrances has, have chemicals too. So the most pure kind of laundry detergents and things like that that you can get are chemical free in all ways, including fragrances. Thank so I just you. To mention That's that. a very important fragrances thing. Fragrances are a big issue. Fragrances, I mean, and you'll see it, products that, that list fragrances on the bottom, and it doesn't tell you anything more than that word. Now, the word fragrance has no meaning in any chemical sense. 
This book, Poison Spring, which I, I will tell you, uh, Valianato's there, he was the EPA guy. All I did was rewrite this book. I mean, I, I took his data and his research and paper trail and turned this thing into this book. But he talks about things like fragrances and also uh, if, you, if you see a product that it will ha it'll have a list of active ingredients and you know, it'll be like you know, a fraction of a percent and then it'll say inactive, and it'll name it, active ingredient equals this. And then it'll say inactive ingredients, 98% but it won't tell you what they are. It turns out that those inactive ingredients can be more toxic than the active ingredients, but again, because of this regulatory system, they don't have to list what they are, or test them for that matter. So when you see something is like largely inactive, that means virtually nothing, and sometimes even the opposite of what you think it means. So for whatever it's worth, this may be a very frustrating kind of summation to say, but it's, a lot of this stuff is really about trying to figure out ways to get better information. Because all of us would make better choices if we had better information. And oftentimes it's only information that we're lacking. If we had information, we could choose this or that. But if we have no information, we, these things seem to be equal. And if we have only information provided by the company selling product A and no information selling product B, if we're bombarded by marketing for product A, we'll tend to buy product A. So in, it, this is really a question, this is true for, for chemicals, it's true for pesticides, it's true for GMOs, it's true for all kinds of things. The more information we have, the better. Because we're all educated consumers and we can make better choices if we have information to go on. So when you see a lot of these industries saying, don't push us to label, that's a really obnoxious point of view because what they're saying is, trust us to give you the stuff that we think is okay. And I think that's really a... It's at least condescending, if not, not somewhat uh, worse than that. Yeah? So should we stop fertilizing our lawns totally? Well, do you want to have this conversation? Uh, do you, like, so what is it, uh, let's just speak generically. Should we stop fertilizing our lawns? One question would be, like, what does your lawn represent to you? Like, what is the, what is the lawn? I mean, Americans, when they moved to the suburbs, the lawn became a very important thing for them. What a lot of people think it's like their it's like their outdoor living room, so or that's one way like we fill it with furniture, or if you're from Baltimore we fill it with plastic flamingos, you know. But what it is is it's like the public face of your family, and so a lot of people equate a lawn with like a public display of their wealth. On one hand, like I have a five-acre plot and 4.9 acres of that is perfect monoculture fertilized pesticide grass, that equals I'm rich somehow, right? I mean, it's gotta be, otherwise there wouldn't be so much of it. If, and so one question is like, why is it that the lawn is like the aesthetic standard that we're all trying to follow? Like, they say the grass is always greener. Well, but that expression comes from somewhere else. I mean, my theory is that it's because Americans, although we got our independence from England a long time ago, there seems to be this weird like uh, hangover that we think the best form of landscaping is to have our lawns like, like, look like a British garden. <laughs> because like none of the plants that most people put in their yards are even native to the United States, let alone their actual bioregion. You know, so like you have a Japanese maple in your front yard, why? <laughs> right, and now not to get too into this, but like turns out that a Japanese maple, like nothing eats a Japanese maple. No insects, no birds, like nothing, like a Japanese maple looks good, but ecologically it's worthless. If you live in Maryland and you plant a white oak, for example, a white oak supports something like 500 different species. Right, bugs love it, birds love it, squirrels love it, everybody loves it. So you have a choice, Japanese maple, white oak, zero support, 500 species. Which one are you gonna plant? Turns out that a white oak, white oak is a beautiful tree and it happens to be native to Maryland. So when you're thinking about your lawn, the question is not just should I fertilize it, but the question is like what do you, what does this space represent to you? What if the aesthetic standard was not monoculture grass, which by the way itself is not native to North America, but the, the standard was how many songbirds and hummingbirds and butterflies can I get per square yard 
in my yard. And what if you had like 37 monarchs and your neighbor only had 25, and he was like, damn, I gotta plant more native plants. You know, wouldn't that be an interesting turnaround? Yeah, but birds can't eat rocks, right? Birds can't eat rocks, neither can butterflies. So why not go, go find yourself a really smart, enlightened a horticulture person or a nursery person or a plant person. Ask them, what should I plant here in Florida, wherever you live, that's native, 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 native? And ask them that question, and they will happily sell you as much as you can afford. You know, the crazy thing about plants is, I don't know if you know this, and I don't know what the equivalents are down here, but in, in New York, the Hudson River is being choked by an, an invasive plant called purple loosestrife. It's a very beautiful plant. It grows in river banks and into the river, and it ends up choking, it, it grows really fast, and it ends up choking off the waterways, right? But it's really pretty, but it's really bad. But in New York, you can still go to a, a plant store and buy it. So you plant this pretty plant in your yard, and suddenly the seeds blow all over the place. They migrate to your nearest creek, and suddenly the creek is dead because of the purple loosestrife. So doesn't it stand to reason that you should basically ban purple loosestrife from being sold in plant stores? Now, the plant store guy has a right to make a profit, but he doesn't necessarily have the right to make a profit off something that's going to choke off the Hudson River. You know what I mean? So this is another, you're talking about little incremental steps. One thing you could do is go to your local plant store and say, what do you got that's native? And don't you think you should stock more stuff that's native? And I'm buying a lot of native stuff, and so would a lot of other people if you had more of it. Right? Those are like the little consumer choices that you can make that suddenly... I mean, there are plant stores all over Maryland now that are like focusing on native plants because this message is like loud and clear in the mid-Atlantic. Right? The native plant thing is, is big and growing. Yeah. Um, every county in the United States has got a master gardener program yep. the extension office. And uh, here in Florida, they've got the Florida Friendly Movement and... Um, for native uh, things, so that's through the uh, University of Florida. Great point. Master Gardeners, uh, your county extension offices, there are lots of places to get educated. Um, and you know, you can't change what monoculture farmers are going to do about monarch butterflies in Nebraska, but you can do what you can do about your own yard. And you know what's a miracle? I mean, again, I don't know if monarchs show up in Florida, but they certainly show up in Maryland. You plant milkweed in your yard, you will get monarch butterflies. It's like you're planting monarchs. Like, how they find it, I mean, I live on one-eighth of an acre in, right outside of the city of Baltimore, and I plant milkweed, and there they are, boom, every year, monarch butterflies. Where are they coming from? Right? You want to plant butterflies? Plant milkweed, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I worked on it. I wanted to add a, a comment on the plastic bottles. I worked on a project in California to bring plant-based plastic bottles across the country and replace the PET. And as we begin to do that, the technology is obviously there to do it. The barrier we ran into was that Coca-Cola and the Manufacturers Association went into an agreement that unless jobs were replaced and the complete industry of recycling had an overhaul, that this would not happen. Particularly because when you recycle PLA or plant-based plastic, if there's more than, I think it's a 10%, uh, there's a 10% contamination rate that occurs with existing plastic and the entire batch has to be thrown out rather than recycled. So that's why something is not quite as simple as we sometimes like to see it. Thank you, and the industry is not making it any easier, that's for sure. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanna make uh, people aware over here at the vendor booth, I have a water that will create water that you can use to do laundry in. And it's ionized water. And it has the same effect as using a soap. Love to show you at No Water Compares. Great, time. thank you. I mean, you, you could probably also tell them about um, new ideas in municipal water treatment using some of this technology, too. Like, the question is, how safe is the water coming out of your tap? You know, if you think about um, municipal water treatment, was these big treatment plants were built 150 years ago with one goal in mind. It was to, you know, stop babies from dying from things like uh, cholera and dysentery. 
So what you do is you dump a bunch of chlorine in there, it kills all that stuff and everybody's happy. So people in the United States no longer die of cholera and dysentery. But if you test the water that is coming out of a water treatment plant, you will still find pesticides and bisphenol A and DDT and uh, you know, the, the runoff from your suburban parking, uh, your, your parking lots and weirdly, like pharmaceutical drugs. You know this, have you read these stories, right? So they tested the water in every major city in the United States and they found quantifiable amounts of, you name it, Viagra, antidepressants, hormone replacement therapy in the drinking water, post-treatment, right? The point is that they didn't have all these problems, these insults to drinking water 150 years ago. These are what you call like emergent problems. These are things that are, we've kind of created and our technology for cleaning up our drinking water has not at the municipal level evolved fast enough. That's why companies are showing up to say, look, you want clean drinking water, we'll, we'll show you how to get it. The answer, by the way, is not in plastic water bottles. Because, I mean, I, you probably know this, but the water in those water bottles is even less regulated than the water coming out of your tap. Water coming out of your tap is regulated. The water coming out of your bottle is not regulated. Why? Because, obviously, you regulate water as in a bottle as a food and not as water. Right? So it's not subjected to the same federal laws about drinking water that your tap water is. Because there's a huge market for